morning, guys. How are we doing this morning? Are you guys happy this morning? I just want to remind you, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Amen? I'm going to read from Ephesians 5, starting at verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Yes, yeah, so can we just close our eyes and give Jesus Christ our attention and just begin to let thankfulness arise in your heart for every good thing he has given you. Jesus, we thank you for salvation. Jesus, we thank you that you died on a cross, a brutal death, and that you rose again, proving to be the Son of God. Jesus, we, we let thankfulness arise and we put it on our lips this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a privilege it is, God, to be here and worship you. In Jesus' name.
Glorify. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, let's continue to lift our voice to the Lord this morning. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in this place today. We love you and we worship you, Lord. May your robe fill this temple this morning. Lord, we thank you for the cross of Calvary. Jesus, we thank you for your pure and spotless blood that was poured out for us. Jesus, we thank you that your back was ripped open on our behalf. Lord, I pray that you feel welcomed in this room this morning. May our hearts be lifted today. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We mean it. We give thanks this morning in your precious, beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we just let's seal it with praise and just give the Lord your affection. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Jesus, we praise you. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys can find your way back to your seats this morning. Tell somebody you love them. And why don't we thank the choir and our worship team as well this morning. Come on. They serve faithfully every single Sunday here. You guys ready to give to the Lord today? Come on. You guys ready to give to Jesus this morning? Amen. Why don't we welcome Raul as he comes up here? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back. Um, I want to read from 2 Corinthians 9 today, just a handful of verses. I know you guys love the Bible here, so um, I won't limit it to one or two verses. We'll go to, to, through about mm, maybe eight or nine. So it'll get, it'll get um, good. Um, but before I do that, I just... I, I have so much gratitude in my heart for, you know, for Michael and Jess and for this house and, and Pastor Benny and the worship team and, and everyone and everything that's in coming out of this house that's, um, that's made all of this happen because maybe when you're local and you're here, you don't realize the impact that's happening um, across the nation and, and I'm sure around the world. But being in Seattle, you know, one of the hardest and darkest and most liberal uh, parts of our nation, to see how God has used Jesus' image in this house to influence and impact um, our region has truly been humbling and like I said earlier, I'm, I'm full of gratitude always for what God started and did in me here because now it's sown a seed on the total opposite side of the country, just about as far as you can get from here. But he started something special that seems to be deeply rooted in the presence of Jesus that I have found here. And I want to, you know, encourage you and, and maybe remind you is, you know, don't and, and I don't and I don't think this is a problem here, but don't ever take the presence of Jesus lightly. Don't ever consider his spirit lightly or for granted as if it's owed because 
It's his mercy that seems to pour out constantly every Sunday. I mean, I've said it here before, and I say it all the time to people who ask me about Jesus' image. I say that there's, there's nowhere else that I know of where you come on a Sunday and the presence of God is as tangible and consistent as it is as Jesus' image. And we're seeing that God's doing something very similar in Seattle. Is, um, we're not, I, I know better than anyone that I'm not anyone special or um, I'm not specially equipped. But I also know better than anyone that God is using someone who's way underqualified to touch um, a people in a city that has been desperate for the presence of Jesus. And I will, I'll forever be so grateful for you guys, not, and not just for the way that um, you steward the presence of God here, although that's incredible, but the way that you guys and, and this whole house has poured into me personally and into um, what the Lord's doing in Seattle and our ministry and coming and being with us, the worship team um, leading us in Seattle. I mean, all of it has brought forth fruit that, uh, you know, I dreamed of and I thought one day it'll happen when I'm in like my 40s or 50s or older. And to watch it happen now uh, is a privilege and an honor that, that I know all started here. And so as I, as I, I'm, as I find myself longer in ministry and kind of going into the depths of it, I'm finding that, you know, there, it can be really messy um, with leaders and with worship and with all sorts of ministry and church-related stuff. But the purity that's in this house and, and from you guys, it really is unparalleled. It's, it's so pure and the presence of God is so tangible because of the purity that happens from the inside out of this house. And um, I know that there's many, many leaders and people and churches and ministries who uh, will never be the same because of what God did here and because of what God's doing here. And we're just, we're one of those, we're one of those fruits and I'm so thankful that I get to come back and, and share the testimony with you guys of um, of what God's doing. So I wanna share a little bit more, but after I, I go into the scripture. So I'll start in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. So the context here, Paul is talking about uh, coming and collecting an offering. In verse six, he says, the point of this, the, the point of collecting this offering is this, whoever s sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart and not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution, of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. <clears throat> There's a grace that comes over a congregation, over an individual, and over a people when your life impacts somebody else's and they glorify, they give thanks to God because of, because of your righteous deeds. So Paul is teaching here that 
because you give, you gave the other churches who I was able to minister to and preach the gospel to. They're giving thanks to God for the gospel and they're giving thanks to God for you because you were the one who supplied the needs for this to happen. Sometimes, you know, uh, we, the, the perspective we take on is like, oh, we need to give because we need to keep the lights on and it costs money to, you know, to pay the bills and to whatever, the, the, the casual stuff, the simple stuff. But giving in the kingdom and, and generosity, the reason the Bible teaches us to give is far greater, the, the, the reason behind it is far greater than just to keep the lights on. It's that when you give, you give a dollar but someone in Seattle is experiencing their miracle or their healing because of the impact and the presence of God that's in the room. So yes, your dollar may be keeping the lights on, but the lights remaining on, they spread the gospel across the nation. And so the testimonies that, you know, in my case, the testimonies that we are experiencing in Seattle, like, I mean, we, we have like a testimony email and people will send their testimonies in there and, you know, sometimes they're silly and people just um, are expressing their feelings, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> but oftentimes we'll get, we'll get people who are, whose lives will never be the same because of what God did. Like there was a man in one of our, our, our gatherings and he's had like just horrible neck and back pain and he was watching his wife and his wife is experiencing the presence of the Lord in, in our, one of our gatherings. And internally, he was like, he was upset because he's like, I need a healing. She's, she's laid out on the floor encountering God, but I'm not feeling anything or experiencing anything. And so he got, said he went home upset and, and is lying in bed, wakes up in the middle of the night, gets up and something pops in his neck and his back. And he said, I've never experienced pain since. I have not experienced pain since. And he said, I've, I repented because I was upset that my wife was experiencing something and I wasn't. And then I got home in the mercy of God. And I thank you for your ministry and I thank God for what he did. Another man uh, emailed us and said, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a businessman, a wealthy businessman in, in Seattle. And he said, I, I didn't have any like major sin in my life that I needed to repent for. But he said, I realized, I, I've, I've been a Christian for many years and I realized when I came to your meeting that I didn't have any major sin, but I had pride and selfishness in my heart. And I came and I, I came to the altar and I died to myself and I gave my life back to Jesus. I found the presence of the Lord. And I mean, we have, we have many more, you know, ears opening and blind eyes opening and people getting saved and delivered and young people falling in love with Jesus all over again, just laying their lives down for, um, for what, God has called them to. And I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of what God's doing in the Northwest and in Seattle. And I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of people's testimonies. But the grace that's released over the action, over the deed, over stepping out and being obedient to the Lord, doesn't just to apply to me and, and our team and our ministry. It applies to where it all began, which is here. And so when you give in your tithes and your offerings, yes, you're giving to keep the lights on. But more than that, you're giving to support the work of the ministry, the, the gospel of Jesus in areas and, and partaking of grace of a testimony of a person that you would probably never meet in your life, you'll probably never hear about, except one day in eternity where your dollar bill changed the life of a person who's now, who's now spending eternity with Jesus because of your generosity. And so Paul is saying here, when you... When you give, God gives you more for you to be even more generous. Because as you're more generous, I get to impact more people and more people will give thanks to God because of your giving. And the ultimate walk, the ultimate goal of the Christian life is to step into the presence of Jesus and he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? So, this morning, um, in your giving, I mean, it should always be generous. And, it, you know, I, I've said it here before, is tithing is not generosity, it's obedience. It's what the scriptures teach. But give this morning in faith with 
the realization with an understanding that um, you're not just partaking of keeping lights on in a building. You're partaking of the testimony of what Jesus is doing. If not anywhere else on the planet, at least in Seattle, but I know it's many, many other places in our nation and in Seattle. Amen? Amen. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll give. So precious Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your grace towards us. We thank you for your presence and your precious blood that is enough for every situation and every circumstance. And this morning as we come with our um, with our gifts, as our, we come with our offerings, with our tithes, we ask Holy Spirit, would you breathe upon them that the dollar would go beyond just Orlando, it would go beyond just the United States, but it would, it would touch the nations for the kingdom of heaven. Lord, in obedience we come and we give ourselves to you. And we ask, would you use us as ministers of the gospel through our giving, that the nations would give thanks and glorify our Father in heaven. And so we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your compassion and grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so to give, whether you want to or not, you should, to give. There's, there's a phone number on the screen. Uh, I think the people online should have a phone number on their screen as well. You can text to give um, or give online. Or if you need an envelope, the ushers should have envelopes, correct? Um, and then I think there's, there might be like a Wi-Fi or an internet problem here sometimes. So you can connect to the free Wi-Fi um, and it should be able to get you through. And if that's not working, feel free to grab an envelope uh, and fill up the information on there. It's safe, it's secure, and um, most importantly, it'll, uh, it'll work the work of the ministry. Amen.
the Lord. Awesome. Uh, before Pastor Michael comes up and uh, teaches us the scriptures, we're going to, uh, you know, as a school, every year we go on missions. Um, we go domestically, we go abroad. In fact, in this year, this is our first time as a school, we're going international. Um, yeah, we're going to Germany. It's awesome. Got students in the room. We also are sending students, which we did last year, to Los Angeles, to Houston, to Atlanta. So we're flooding this nation as well as going abroad. And then we're sending a huge team right here in Orlando. They're flooding this city, this whole region. Um, we go into convalescent hospitals. We go to schools and teach the children. Um, we give to the poor. We help food banks out. We do it all. We preach the gospel. We pray for the sick. And we're, we have seen tremendous impact here, and not only here, but across the nation over these past few years as we did it. Uh, but this morning, what we're going to do is we, like Pastor Michael and Jess have said, you know, we are ascending church. And so we pray and believe God. We do this together. So as the, as the students are going to Germany, in fact, we're flying out tonight. We're doing it. We, we want the church to be praying with us and to cover us in prayer and that we are not... We just don't go, but we're sent, and we're sent biblically. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And so if you are going to Germany, I want you guys to come up here, all students and as well as the leaders who are going. Let's welcome them as they come up. Yes. Amen. Amen. And we're going to have our pastors come up as well as some of the leaders, Joe, Carla, uh, Kathleen, and Nathan. If you guys would come up, they're going to cover, cover us in prayer this morning. All right. Amy, Aaron, Josh, and Kaylee, why don't you guys come up as well? And Ryan, just, just quickly, uh, what will they be doing in Germany? Yeah, so we're going to be uh, partnering with the Sisters of Mary in Dormstadt in Germany. We're going to be helping them uh, across their grounds as well as going out with them to evangelize in the city. They're doing yeah. a worship night, so we're going to bring the loss in to the city, which is going to be absolutely beautiful, as well as we're going to be with Brother Yoon uh, tomorrow night and Isaac wow. in I Germany. Wow, I think we're jealous, huh? Yeah, so, yeah, so I was telling them. Just, uh, You'll be at the church with Brother Yoon? We will be, yeah, wow. tomorrow night. So we're thankful, Amazing. and we'll be drinking coffee and eating cake with the sisters of Mary's. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's stretch our hands. Thank you, Lord. Baby, why don't you start praying? We thank you, God, for these precious students, Lord. Lord, we Let's ask all just pray that you in the will spirit. be with them, Lord, as they yeah, go Lord. out, Father. We thank you, blessing Father, for touch. their lives that are laid down, thank Jesus. And we thank touch. you, God, that there will be a deposit that is made, Lord, in that region, God. And that we will sow whatever it is you call us to sow in those regions. But, Lord, I'm also asking that they will be filled afresh, God, as they go out, Lord. There's a way of seeing Jesus in the poor and seeing Jesus in those in need, Lord. And I thank you, God, that they will be aware of your presence, Lord, like never before, God, and they will fall deeper in love with you, Lord, as they go out and give, Lord, to those that are in need, Jesus. And I thank you, God, even now across the world, you're preparing the hearts of the people, Lord. You're preparing the brokenhearted to receive Jesus. You're preparing those, God, that don't want anything to do with Jesus to receive this blessed gospel, Lord. And I thank you, God, for wisdom and discernment, God. We thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus over this team, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around them, Lord. And we thank you, God, that that region will never be the same, not because of them, but because of Jesus, who they are carrying, God, as they go wherever it is that you send them, Lord. We thank you, God. Lord, even let them be a blessing to Brother Yoon and his family, Lord. I pray, God, that they will receive strength, God, when our team comes. Lord, let them receive. I feel that really strong in the sisters, Lord. I thank you, God. That, Lord, we go there, we're thinking they're going to impart to us, Lord, but let us also be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, leaders need it too, God. So I thank you, Lord, that the weight, God, that they're carrying, God, in that region, Lord, that there will be an ease and they will feel like their brothers and sisters in the Lord have come to carry their arms up when they need it, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for great testimonies. Let the sick be healed in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. That, Lord, when they leave, people will say they know Jesus. 
In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Just keep your hands stretched out by faith. Father, we ask, we thank you for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon them. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. May they be a great, a great blessing, Lord, to that region. In Jesus' precious name, may they be sent out today with the blessing from heaven and the blessing of your people. And so we collectively, we collectively pray a blessing upon you that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord and that his precious word is a lamp and a light unto your feet and that he would lead you and guide you. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Can we let them know we love them, we honor them. So thankful. God bless you guys. Come on, church. Love on them a bit. And tonight, tonight we'll pray for the second half of the team, or not even half. That's just a portion of the students who are going. Isn't it a blessing to be part of something so beautiful? Thank you, Jesus. Babe, can I have that, uh, my Bible and the, and the folder as well? And my iPad, yeah. Yeah, two of you to grab uh, one little thing there, huh? I got it. <laughs> oh, the life in the Culianos house is so fun. Well, I've got good news here. Uh, you may want to just stand. All I can say is prayer works. We have our DP permit and we can start. <laughs> Hallelujah. We can start. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So why don't you come back up, babe, and then uh, Carla, why don't you come just real quick and kind of explain what I'm holding. I just know it feels like a miracle. Uh, it's been a long road. But Carla, so what does this mean? Yes, so basically this is the um, permit that we have been waiting on because it really is a trigger effect after this. And so um, this is a de developmental permit that will let us begin our civil work because obviously you have to prepare the roads before you can build a building. Right, and, and the so, land and the ground, so surveying starts and... Oh uh, yes, all of those things are actually in motion and we should be able to begin uh, actual movement on things. want to so thank you and Jay and... Uh, Jay's somewhere, or, but, but anyways, they worked so hard, and uh, I heard through the grapevine, Carla, that you were quite persistent. I told Pastor Michael uh, this week that I was going to put my kind boxing gloves on, and um, it worked. We did it. So, <laughs> well, I had talked to the staff, and I said. I'm going to start a fast every other day until this thing breaks. And I think that freaked Carla out. <laughs> it wasn't a hunger strike. It was just a, a, a fast. But um, isn't this wonderful? It's what we've been praying for. All those prayer meetings on Sunday nights. Now we're going to keep praying that the building take place uh, smoothly, consistently, that hopefully no storms or hurricanes come and slow it down this summer and that the Lord provide every single penny needed until we're debt free on that building. In Jesus' name. Carla, thank you. I want you, huh? Yeah, I want you guys to all really thank Carla. She's worked so hard. Thank you, love you. And, and um, the team, oh, the minute we got the per permit, the builder started ordering stuff, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, give her the mic there. Yes. <laughs> what did they order? Uh, so underground pipes, which like are... The, was that before we got the permit? It, it, it was before we got the permit so because they order. were also in faith. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Can we give Jesus all the praise one more time? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. One more time. Come on, give him all the glory. Thank you, Father. Father, we, we pray, Lord, that the generations after us would fall in love with your dear son there and that your presence and glory would rest there, that it would be like heaven on earth. 
and that millions upon millions would come through that property, Lord, long after we're in heaven should you tarry, and that our children's children's children will carry on in your presence, that our families would grow up in your glory, and that your precious body and blood would be served there as healing to the nations, that your word would go forth in great power, and that the sound of worship would draw your precious heart to dwell and rest among your people. Do it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's give him glory one more time. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Why don't you love on just a few people? That's three, by the way. And then grab a seat. It's not two and it's not four. It's three, at least here. All right, all right. Take your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Being that I am Greek, I get to celebrate two Easter Sundays. In fact, yesterday I had the joy of uh, going to see my mom and dad with the whole family and my cousin and got to take the kids to one of the little Orthodox chapels I used to sit in. When I was 10 or 12, I'd walk there from my grandmother's house, and I would feel the Lord drawing me into this little chapel, and I'd sit there real quietly, always feeling like something would happen. And uh, I can't say I had a vision or anything like that, but I certainly felt the peace of the Lord there and felt him calling me as a young boy. So it was really special to take my kids and Jess and my cousin's children there and then be there with my mom and dad yesterday. It was so wonderful. And we walked in, there was a sweet young lady just sitting in this small chapel all alone. It was probably about 5 o'clock, yeah, around 5 p.m. And she was just sitting there, uh, eyes teared up, waiting on the Lord. And uh, yeah, it was really, really special. So I got, I'm going to celebrate Easter again uh, on May the 5th. And we're going to eat a big lamb, which is always anointed. And uh, we'll sing and uh, both sides of the family will come over. It'll be wonderful. So if you like lamb, you can just celebrate another Easter, the Eastern calendar. Um, take your Bibles to Matthew 5. That being said, we're going to move now in. We're going to continue after um, Resurrection Day into the teachings of Jesus. And then from there, we'll move into Pentecost. And I'll teach on the person of the Holy Spirit and his relationship with the Father, the Son, and the people of God. So we're, we're in for a great journey together. Aren't you grateful for the Lord? Let's just pray. Wonderful Holy Spirit, you are the author of Scripture. And scripture is breathed by God, and you are the breath of God. And so we ask you, Holy Lord, to... Open the eyes of our understanding to the revelation of Jesus. Open our hearts and soften every hard heart in this place. Soften any area of my heart, Lord, that is hard. We all come needy, asking you to bear eternal fruit in and through us, and may your holy word that is the very seed of God bring great life within us in our families in this church and all those visiting. We long to stand before the throne having been found faithful. And your word says that you are able to present us before the throne blameless. And may we be filled with joy in that moment as you smile at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Okay, Matthew 5, verse 1. We're going to continue in the Beatitudes that are the constitution of the kingdom and should be the constitution of our hearts. Say this out loud. Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. Say, Christ crucified is beautiful. Say the cross 
is beautiful. I'm going to get into that a bit more as we dive into this text. There's a lot going on in the body right now. There's a lot going on everywhere. It is the loudest, the noisiest age that there has ever been on the planet. Uh, everyone has something to say, and unfortunately, now they have a platform to do it. And some good-hearted people are trying to do good things, but they're falling into the devil's way of trying to accomplish a good thing, and that never produces a good thing. Without knowing, we throw pearls to swine and offer the world commentary on what belongs to God and his people. So we really need the wisdom of God right now. It is such a blessing to not give your eyes and ears to social media. It really would cause your heart to warm. And I'm, I, I know we use it, so that might sound hypocritical, but uh, Jess will tell you, I celebrate when I don't have to look at it. There are still ancient pathways that are required to know God. And they don't change with the age. They will never change. And we need Holy Spirit vision and wisdom if we're going to survive this age and burn more brightly in the heart with first love when we end this thing. And so we have to ask ourselves questions like, why do we know more about trendy debates online than the Beatitudes? Why are we more equipped to, let's just say, activate people prophetically than knowing the Beatitudes? Why are we more familiar with a leader's sin than knowing Matthew 5? These texts from Matthew 5 are the revelation of the divine heart of the holy lawgiver. And so I want to begin reading in verse 3. I know I've touched on this before, but it's impossible to read the Beatitudes properly without reading them in sequence. So we want to read them with a Holy Spirit flow and realize that each Beatitude leads to an experience of the next Beatitude. Does that make sense? Verse 3, we've touched on this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If someone could just help me with that precious little baby, just for until he or she is done, I totally get it, completely. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So being poor in spirit is the realization of my need for God. How many of you know that on our own, we are an absolute mess? Did anyone say amen to that? Okay. If not, just give it a little time. So the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who realize their utter dependency on God. That leads you into the experience of verse 4, which is mourning over the revealed sin in our lives that comes via the light of the Holy Spirit. A mourning takes place that is not unhealthy. Now that doesn't mean you should be so into yourself that you lose vision of Jesus. But our sin should never make us happy. And any time we feel like sin is not a big deal, 
we need to ask the Holy Spirit for a fresh revelation of the passion and suffering of Christ Jesus on the cross. All right. Sin is not more powerful than the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And as I taught on Good Friday, and I got such encouraging emails. Esther was telling me in the children's church that, or in the babies, like we're the, in the nursery, that God started moving while I was teaching on Good Friday with the children. Is that, were any of y'all in there? Anyone? Were you guys in there? Yeah. And as I began to teach very slowly on the passion, God, the Holy Spirit began to move throughout this campus. If we are ever wondering if sin is a big deal, though, how, however, we do need to look at the passion of the Lord. And while it isn't more powerful, as I said earlier, remember, upon the face of Jesus, the spittle of the garrison and his precious blood collided, and his face, which is the glory of God, became the meeting place, the colliding point for the worst man could possibly offer, which is to spit on the face of God. And the best God could offer which is the holy blood of his only son. They both collided, and by his mercy, the blood won. I said the blood won. Jesus is king over sin and death. But our sin should create a mourning deep within us. And when we begin to mourn, we are promised comfort. That's the end of verse 4. The comfort of the Spirit that comes through regeneration, that comes through a resurrected life, that comes through the washing of the word, that comes through the infilling of the spirit, that comes through a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Lord in his mercy begins to comfort our own mourning. Isn't that so gracious? As we move into verse five, the scripture says, blessed are the meek. So those who mourn and are comforted by the spirit over their own inadequacy, they do not become more hard. They actually become softer. Less judgmental. If judgment is prevailing in the church, you will absolutely connect that to self-righteousness and pride. Anytime you see judgment, and I don't mean holy judgment, because the reality is, is we've done a bad job ecclesiologically, in other words, within church structure and church leadership. We've done a bad job with church discipline. We've done a bad job with dealing with sin. There are some pretty terrifying texts in the Bible that are meant to terrify us, like Matthew 18. If it doesn't work one-on-one, -on -one, then you take more with you. If that doesn't work, you bring it to the church. That is meant to freak you out. It's meant to create the fear of God and how we need it. I said how we need it. So our unity is that big of a deal. Just think of that. Jesus says if there's no, no effort, then if, the, if it doesn't work, then bring it to the church. And by the way, that doesn't mean YouTube. It means church leadership, bring it to the church. Doesn't necessarily mean a massive gathering. Bring it to the leaders of the church. Who, by the way, those who are spiritual, the scripture says, or we'd store somebody in gentleness. So spirituality is always connected to that when it comes to helping people along. But the scripture teaches here that once I've mourned over my sin and I'm comforted by the spirit and I've experienced poverty of spirit in verse 3, which is what it means to be poor in spirit, I'm I'm led eventually to meekness. And meekness is so holy, so treasured by the Lord, that the gift I receive or the promise I receive once that characteristic is found in me. You know what the gift is? The earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So everybody here needs to decide what you would like to obtain, victory in a verbal exchange or the earth? And why would God trust the earth in the age to come 
to the meek because he loves a pliable heart and he despises a hard heart. This is so incredible to me. And I, I think, I think one of the reasons we've lost a desire for meekness is because we've lost a vision of the age to come. Because you're not interested in inheriting the earth. You don't care, not you, but you don't care because you want to win now. And America loves a winner. And I like to win too. If we're going to do something, you probably have to kill me to beat me. You might beat me, but I'm going to give every ounce I have. Ping pong, whatever, pickleball, certainly golf. Like, I'm going to go down fighting. Maybe God has to work it out of me. I don't know, but he hasn't yet. And, and one of the reasons that, uh, according to one of my dear friends that I mentioned, who pastors thousands of people in our nation and a massive denomination, called me after Good Friday. He watched the service here and he said, it was amazing to see this place jam-packed. He said, do you know that in many evangelical circles in America, that Good Friday is attended, is attended at 20% in comparison to Easter. And the reason that's the case is because we love a winner without wounds. So it's not to say that Jesus didn't win. It's just to say we've lost the vision of how he won. Right now I'm writing a, I finished yesterday, thank you Lord, my final paper in one of my classes for uh, graduate school and Jesse drove yesterday to see my parents so I could write the paper while she was driving. And I had to write in a, a, a commentary on a writing by St. Francis of Assisi on the connection between joy and suffering. And which, by the way, are eternally connected. And that paradox confounds the wise. How could Jesus endure the cross with joy? And so around the world, not, not so much in America, I mean, getting tasered on social media is not the same as being beheaded. I said it's not. It's not the same as having your family in prison. Like, we're doing okay. I said, we're all, we're all doing okay. There are nations in the world where you, you can't do this. But Christians, since the inception of the faith, have been marked and identified as being Christians by not the way they celebrate in good times, but the way they shine when they suffer. And what I'd like to submit to all of us this morning is this is the way of the cross. And the cross is the only way of Christ. There's no other version. And I think we've made the cross and the resurrection a linear journey or a linear vision. It's like I go through that phase at one point in my life and now I'm into this resurrection phase. But it's not linear scripturally. The two are congruent. They run parallel together and they are connected. And so Jesus endures the cross with joy. The Roman soldier declares Jesus to be son of God when he's standing on Golgotha. By the way, Jesus dies. 
Incredible, right? That it's by the way Jesus dies that this soldier goes, that's God? I thought God isn't supposed to suffer. And so one of the things Francis writes that I had to comment on was about his love for the cross. His love for Holy Communion. His love for the scriptures that he told his disciples, or his, I should say his, his, his brothers who came to live with him in the monastery. He told them, treasure every word that God has spoken. You see, all of this was beautiful to Francis. And prior to Francis' encounter with God, if he was in, within two miles of a leper colony, he would cover his face and look at it with disgust. Eventually, he would go and serve the leper colony and begin kissing the lepers so that he could identify with the Christ who washes the feet of those who are dirty. You know what's concerning me is that we're losing our beauty. We're losing our beauty because we want to be right here. And so one guy said, uh, beauty will save the world. I, I'd agree with that. I would just need a definition of that beauty if I were to agree with it. How many of you believe that um, should Jesus tarry, uh, you'll breathe your last one day? Okay, if you don't believe it, I, I may believe it for you. It'll happen. You will die one day, physically. Okay, that'll happen. Uh, you can try to keep that from happening. And you, you mean you should do everything you can because God cares about the body. So much so that he's going to glorify the body in him one day. Isn't it wonderful we're going to receive glorified bodies? If we didn't, you would not survive the marriage with Jesus. You'd fry. This is a very important thing. Okay. We should, but regardless of how much cardio you do, and you should do cardio. Okay? You should not eat like a confused buffalo, all right? You, 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 you should take care of yourself, all right? There's nothing spiritual about making yourself sick. In fact, it'll affect your spirit. You really cannot disconnect from a creative standpoint regarding the Lord's creation of us. You, the, the, the body is connected. We, when we suffer physically, it has an impact on the soul and the heart. There's no doubt about it. So regardless of how hard we try, we will all breathe our last. How many of you believe God is holding your breath this morning? Okay, let me tell you when that'll be very real to you. When your breath starts leaving you and you know it's happening. So we all say the Lord is my life. I believe that you believe that, but you really believe that when you realize you're not holding your breath. But if you've ever watched someone die in the Lord or die in darkness, and I've seen both many times, oftentimes, if it's not sudden death, that, that process begins to set in and you can sense that person, especially if they don't know Jesus, holding on for dear life, trying to keep that breath within them. And so it's in the moment that we die that we finally realize we've been created. Huh? All of us will face that day. It's interesting, the longer you walk with Jesus and age, 
I'm going to be 47 this year, and man, I thought anybody who was 47 was super ancient. <laughs> you can play the senior golf tour at 50, so if Pastor Michael bolts in 2028, you'll know where he's at. Uh, no, I'm joking. It's a joke. Got a building to build. I might take a few weeks off. As Carla said, amen. <laughs> the church is losing, in many cases, not everywhere, she's losing her fragrance. Because success now, at, and oft, oftentimes at a leadership level, is about me exegeting ink and paper and trying to prove that you're wrong and forgetting the death, burial, and resurrection in my exegesis. And so I glory in the victory and the volume of my point and I lose what is most valuable to the Lord that is love for him and love for brother and sister. When I talk about the beauty of the Lord, the Lord Jesus did not, back to this death piece, the Lord Jesus never told us, he did say that we would not die, but he wasn't talking about it physically. All of us will face that day, and that's why the last enemy to, to be dealt with will be death, the scripture says. So when we say you've defeated death, what we're really saying is you've, trans you've transformed it. And that's why the, the, the hymn we always put up, we had it up for Good Friday, the ancient church hymn. Trampling down death, the old hymn says. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. And to those in the tombs, bestowing life. And so Jesus did not deal with death from a distance. He experienced this physical death as much as anyone, if not more so, to have ever lived. And by his entering into the grave, he transformed the tomb and made it a womb. And so now we say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're the church. We don't fear the tomb. We don't fear that last exhale. Because we shall be with the Lord. So when it comes to beauty, not only has the, has the Lord redeemed it, he's completely redefined it. And so now the cross in God's eyes is beautiful. For example, when you lose beauty, you look at baptism as just this mere outward confession of an inward decision. Oh, really? Was that what the scriptures actually teach? Or is it a tomb? Does the scripture not say that when we're baptized, we put on Christ? Does the scripture not teach that we're the... Where when God's people go through the water in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit is there. Does the scripture not teach that the Holy Spirit descended when Jesus was baptized? Does the Holy Spirit not teach that Paul had an encounter with God when he's baptized in water? And because we can't figure out how water from the city of Orlando that flows through a hose and goes into that baptismal tank, because we can't figure out how that becomes a scalpel, that separates us from the world, we just don't know what to do with it and we rob it of its spiritual beauty. It is pride to the nth degree to refute something because we don't get it. Can we have fun now? Can I have fun at your expense? <laughs> Jess is 42. A lot happens in the female body at 42. 
Sometimes I look at her and go, all right, do I know you? What'd you just say? How? Wait, huh? There's a lot we don't understand. And by the way, men, you go through that hormonal shift as well. We all do. We don't get each other. We don't get nuclear physics. There's a lot we don't understand about light. We don't understand a lot about human relationship and interaction. Why do I have to fully understand in the brain, this little brain, everything that happens when somebody goes into the water that the Holy Spirit rests upon according to Genesis 1? Why do I need to get that in order to worship the God who promised it? It's prideful. It's prideful. And so we strip it we sterilize the faith that's meant to be beautiful and fragrant and filled with mystery. In just a few moments, I'll bring the elements of communion up and pray over them. Do the scriptures actually teach that there's nothing to that? Is it really saltine and Welch's? And again, don't let your denomination determine your theology. Look to the scriptures, look to the fathers of the church, look to those who birthed the church. What has the church believed since day one? That that meal delivers you. That's the whole point of Passover in Exodus 12. This meal delivers those who are in darkness under the slavery of Pharaoh. And they left well, and they left strong, and there were none feeble among them. Well, I don't like that. You would if you needed healing. It's not about understanding at all. It's about faith. I thought we are saved by grace through faith. Why can't the grace of the Spirit Rest upon these beautiful experiences that, that are gifts to the church from God. And why can't we trust them by faith and experience his grace in the moment? Why would Jesus tell us to anoint the sick with oil if it's just Crisco? And I don't use Crisco. I use Greek olive oil. First cold press, extra virgin, from the island of Crete. That doesn't help you spiritually, but I, that's what I like to do. So can the God who spoke the cosmos into existence and keep the sun at the perfect distance from the earth so that it neither freezes nor burns, can the God who keeps the stars by the billions in this universe from colliding into this planet, could he possibly use the sacrament of the anointing of oil to bring healing to a little piece of dust called my body? I feel so bad for so much of this generation who's gl glorying in intellectual ascent and not in a burning heart. Don't misunderstand me, I deeply value theology. We just may have a different definition of it. In the West, uh, great theology leads you to believe a set of points on a piece of paper, and I would say that that's important. But the scriptural narrative, if you were to use Luke 24, for example, as Jesus reveals himself to the disciples who can't see him on the road to Emmaus, he opens their blindness to his person with the cracking open of scripture and the breaking of the bread of communion. And it ends with they see him and have a burning heart. That's the goal of true theology. And if a burning heart were the goal, if clearer vision of Jesus were the goal, as it was for Jesus when he was teaching those disciples who couldn't see him. Aren't you grateful you serve a Savior who wants to open our blindness? That's all pastoring is. Moms and dads, that's all, well, it's not all parenting is. <laughs> 
parenting is a lot of stuff. Let me say that another way. When it comes to your children experiencing the Lord through your parenting, this is your job to get their eyes to open and behold Him. To see their hearts burn. And do you think that um, it's a coincidence that their hearts burned and they could see Him? Does the scripture not say, and we'll get there in a, maybe in a few weeks, blessed are the pure in, for they shall You'll never see him without a heart that's burning. We need the beauty of Jesus again. So we strip the power of the sacraments out of the church. We strip mystery from the church. and We call it dangerous. Now it's dangerous to live like Frankenstein. <laughs> and think because I don't get it. It can't be God. Now, I'm not endorsing weirdness. That's hurt us. At the same time, let God define weird. You say, stick with the Bible. Sure, I will. Where do you want to go? You want to go with Ezekiel's vision? Who's lifted up by his hair by the hand of God? Sounds pretty weird. You want to go with Moses striking the dust and gnats attacking Egypt? That's pretty weird. Don't do that in my yard. <laughs> huh? How about dipping a rod in the Wakaiva River and it becoming blood? Kind of weird. No? Yes or no? Yes. How about scales falling from the apostles or Saul's eyes at the time? Pretty wild. Well, he would have been Paul by then. That's wild. What if prayer teams, you're praying for someone and scales fall on your Jordans? You'd have a problem with it. It'd be a little weird. Let's let the scripture define what's weird and what's not. So what is beautiful to God? The crucified Lamb of God. Now, what would that do for the world if crucifixion were beautiful again? What would that do for your family if death to self was beautiful? You know what it would do? You'd be the quickest one to forgive in your whole family. What would happen in the church if washing feet took the place of screaming back and forth? What could happen? And you know, it's so interesting. We all pray for a move of God because we're addicted to the stuff that comes with God. We like the bells and whistles. We like the look. We like the sound. We like the songs that come from it and the writing sessions. We, we like all the trinkets. We like all the pixie dust. But who's actually saying, Lord, you come? We're more quick to pray for the move of God, the stuff he does. But the bride longs for his heart. You say, but Jesus is raised from the dead. He sure is. Hallelujah. I said he sure is. However, the person of the Lord Jesus himself speaks let me say that again. His being, the incarnate Christ Jesus, declares, even if his mouth isn't moving, because he himself is truth. To some, believing Jesus' bio is to believe truth. And again, let me say, you got to get Jesus right. Born of a virgin. Yes. Perfect and holy. Yes. Lived a sinless life. Yes. Suffered. Died. Walked through his passion and perfection. Yes. Crucified. Breathed his last. The son of man. Son of God. All at once. Laying his life down. Absolutely amen. Going into the ground. 
being buried, vital, absolutely, being raised from the dead, massive, or we are the most pitiful of all, Paul said. Huge. His ascension, absolutely pivotal that he sits at the right hand of the Father as high priest, and he himself, according to Isaiah, is the covenant. That means if he's not at the right hand of the Father, our salvation is toast. He's keeping us. And you cannot separate Pentecost from his enthronement. So Jesus said, or I should, yes, John says of Jesus in John 7 that the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. The two are connected. The glorification and the outpouring. Pentecost was God's way of saying, I made it. I'm on the throne because the two are connected. It's vital. The fundamentals of the faith are vital. That's why we read the creed every single time I baptize you. It's so important. His second coming is massive. You say, I don't care about it. Just stick around a little longer. <laughs> this is an election year. All of y'all are going to be wanting Jesus to come. You mark my words. Come mid-fall. It's a big deal, his coming. Because Jesus is worthy of an inheritance. Jesus earned a bride. He earned the name above all names, according to the Philippians. That he suffered death, even the death of the cross. He's been given the name above every name. He's coming back to rule and reign on a planet that he loves and amongst the people that he loves way more than the planet. It's a huge deal. But you can know all that here and have an icy heart. I'm not saying throw out everything I just mentioned, but all of that is meant to lead you to a fiery heart for Jesus. Theology is meant to lead us to doxology. To worship. If your theology leads you to coldness and accusation, you need a different theological method. I'm so glad I was raised the way I was. So glad. So glad I didn't look at our priest and call him by his first name. Now you don't have, I don't care what you call me. I'm just saying I'm glad the way I was raised. I'm glad that when an elder is in our house, they take the head of the table. Because that's beautiful. What's beautiful about it? Where they're sitting? No. What's beautiful is the preference of another. It's cruciform. It's Calvary in action. I don't want to get so busy in our ministry that I can't take care of my parents as they age. I don't want to be traveling the world, flying from place to place, and miss what the Lord has spoken clearly. Because only the Lord knows if I'm meant to fly to Albania. What I do know is he said, honor your mother and father. Why would he say things like that? Why would he teach us to take the lowest and the worst seat? It's because he's a crucified one. So back to Jesus, his being, his embodiment, who is still incarnate. He's fully God and fully man. He himself speaks. What am I getting at? In his resurrected, glorified body. Listen up. Whom John could not even look at initially, but fell to the ground. As though he were dead. Paul falls to the ground. And blinded by the glorious light of the one who created the sun. With one word. In that glorified body. Who shines brighter than a million suns and a million galaxies and stars. He kept the wounds in the body. You missed it. You missed it. The fact that Jesus kept the wounds. Tells me 
that woundedness, that the cross, that joy is forever married to pain. And that's what the world doesn't get. That would cause her to fall in love with Jesus. Calvary and glorification are forever linked. That produces meekness. Because my example is not a superhero. My example is the wounded and raised Christ. Do you get it? Blessed are the meek, for they inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. In Psalm 24, in closing, that I'm going to pray over the communion. Don't you feel the holy presence of God? Psalm 24, verses 3 through, through 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. Nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Friends, you cannot earn your righteousness this morning, but you are meant to hunger and thirst for it. Psalm 50, verses 5 through 6 Listen to the words of God. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness. Say his righteousness. For God himself is judge. The scriptures say that our righteousness is like a filthy rag before the Lord. What type of righteousness should we be hungering for? Say the righteousness of God. In Psalm 45, verse 7, it's one of my favorite psalms, speaking of the bridegroom to come, who is Jesus. You love righteousness. Say love righteousness. And you hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Jesus loves righteousness and he hates, hates wickedness. Psalm 45 in the same Psalm verses 6 I, I, I just read verse 7 to you, but I want to back up and just read verse 6 to you. Look at this. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Say, I need the righteousness of Jesus. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Write these down. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. Wow. Paul's saying, I am God's representative. He's pleading through me for you. We implore you. In other words, we're just shy of begging you. On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Many of you in this room, you know what's so horrible about so much of the Christian experience in our part of the world is that we tip God and think we're doing God this great favor by walking in. 
and I, you know, I've, got, I've done my church thing for the week. And here we see the apostle imploring people to be reconciled to God. And many of you in this room need to be reconciled to God. You're going your own way. You have been. Some of you for weeks, some of you for years, some for days. You need to hear the mercy of God crying out to you today and the voice of the Holy Spirit through his word longing to reconcile you to the Father. How does that happen? According to this verse, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, who never ever sinned in any way, took upon himself your sin so that you would carry his righteousness. Say thank you, Lord. Romans 3.10 says, 3.11, as it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. How many are righteous in their own standing? I want to hear you. Are you sure? Am I righteous in my own strength? Jess? Nobody. How about the sisters? What about Brother Yoon? No. There are none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There are none who seek God. This is life prior to receiving the righteousness of Jesus. Lastly, verses 21 through 23 of the same chapter, Romans 3. The Bible says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. In other words, you can be righteous outside of trying to obey every tenant of the law because it's impossible. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. Say, Jesus, I long to experience your righteousness. Through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You say, Michael, what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? It means simply this, to hunger and thirst for Jesus, the righteous one. And the Bible teaches, without anyone moving, the Bible teaches that we've been justified. And that doesn't mean that we've just been declared as being not guilty. God has gone much further than just saying not guilty. He's much better than an earthly judge. He's gone so far to say, not only is Joe not guilty, Joe is now carrying my innocence. You said, no way. Oh yeah, that's the gospel. That's what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the flow of the Beatitudes. It leads you to a place where you say, my righteousness won't do it. My works will not do it. My pilgrimages, while they might edify me, they won't do it. I am still a filthy rag in my own righteousness. I am stained with blood. I need a stain remover. I need another's blood to wash my blood away. I don't want the blood on my hands. I want his blood to wash me. And then we receive the very righteousness of God. And the scripture says here in Matthew 5 that if we hunger and thirst for it, we shall be filled. Did you know Jesus is food? That's what it says in John 6. He said, I am the bread of God. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Did you know that Jesus is drink? John 4, verses 10 through 14, he tells the woman sitting on Jacob's well, 
that he has water that she should drink, that she should ask for, and if she drinks of it, she'll never thirst again. Did you know that Jesus says his blood is our drink? I can hear it already. This is hard. It's exactly what they said. He says in Matthew 26, verses 27 through 29, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Say, Jesus, close your eyes right where you are. Would you just lift your hands to heaven? Say, Jesus, I long for your righteousness. Now with every head bowed and eye closed before we receive Holy Communion, you can put your hands down. Emma, would you come up, please? There is nothing you can do on your own to remove the stain of your past, the stain of the things you've said, the stain of the things you've done. Nothing, nothing you can do but throw your life at the foot of the cross. This morning, with every head bowed and eye closed, no one looking around, nobody, nobody moving, I want to ask you, is your heart longing to be made right with God? Do you feel the Holy Spirit imploring you to be reconciled to God? Are there others of you in the room who have not been following Jesus like you were at one time? Perhaps you walked with him in fiery love and that, that fire's gone out. The cares of this world are choking out that seed that was planted by God when you heard the gospel preached. So those are the two people I'm talking to. And with every head bowed and eye closed, you feel like, Michael, I feel the Lord speaking to me this morning. I, I need the righteousness of God. I want you to raise your hand. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'm not going to call you forward this morning for the sake of time, but I want everyone to stand. I want us to pray this out loud. And I'd like the ushers to come. They can come now with the communion elements. Can we close our eyes and just pray this out loud? Holy Father, wash me with the precious blood of Jesus. I've sinned against you. And I realize it. And I'm so sorry. Ignoring you breaks your heart. And I don't ever want to break your heart. I want to be trusted by you, Jesus. I declare and confess that Jesus Christ is the Holy Son of God, that he suffered and died and shed his precious blood that he was raised from the dead and is alive forevermore. And today, Lord Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. One day, you will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. And I want to be ready. So I repent today of my sin. I repent of my cold heart and I renounce the devil and the ways of this world and I give my full affection and my full life, my full attention, my will to the Lord Jesus Christ and I declare you to be the Holy Son of God in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Can we just thank the Lord this morning? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.
Would someone please, please bring me the elements here? Thank you. Let's come to the Lord in reverence this morning. Holy Father, I lift these elements to you, these blessed gifts. Oh, wonderful Lord. While we can't see you with the natural eye, Lord, you're the one who appeared to those blinded disciples from Emmaus. When you tore the bread, they beheld you, and then you vanished, telling us that we should see you in the blessed communion. Now, Lord, as we've asked you to forgive us and cleanse us, we realize the weight and the holiness of coming to your table where you are food and drink. And we long to re receive this worthily in righteousness, in repentance. And I pray, Lord, as I lift these gifts to you and present them to you, these holy mysteries, that your presence would come down and that your people, Lord, your sheep would feast upon you, the only shepherd who dies for his own sheep and offers himself as their very food. Feed your people this morning with your body and blood. Heal them. Heal every sick body in this place, every sickness of those watching around the world. Heal your people. And as they girded themselves on that first Passover night to leave the rule of Pharaoh. May they be delivered from all that is not of you and their spirit, soul, and body. And may your blessed power flow through them as they receive your body and blood. I pray for many to be healed as they approach the elements of your body and blood. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. If you've never received communion here, you'll be dismissed row by row you'll come up you will take the elements back to your seat and we're going to ask that you just don't receive it alone that you receive it with someone if you're if you see somebody who is by themselves please invite them into receiving communion with you and if you're alone just simply ask somebody if if you can receive with them as well god bless you we'll see you tonight and may the lord touch you and heal you and strengthen you through his precious body and blood Amen. You can be seated. The ushers will call you forward. Team.
We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here as we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works he has done. May the generations come to find him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for his people. 